Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 258. A hero is someone who has given his or her life to something bigger than oneself. Joseph Campbell. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Blackbox. Blackbox is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content, and you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Studio Unknown. Studio Unknown is a crack team of audio post professionals known for quality sound on any indie budget. Whether you need a lush surround sound mix or a quick festival submission pass, Studio Known can help you with all of your post-sound needs, from sound design and mix to Foley, ADR, and even a custom score. Contact Studio Known and mention the Indie Film Hustle podcast, and you'll get 50% off one day of ADR or 10% off your complete post-sound package. Just go to studiounknown.com. Now, today on the show, we have an OG in the DIY filmmaking movement on YouTube, His name is Griffin Hammond. Many of you guys who are listening to me probably already know him. He used to be the host on the YouTube channel Indie Mogul where he was dishing out amazing uh, tutorials and education on about how to make films uh, cheaply and do it yourself. And he's just really done a lot for the filmmaking community. And I've followed him for many years, even before I started Indie Film Hustle. And uh, I've always wanted to talk to Griffin. And I finally got an opportunity to bring him on the show and I had the pleasure of being on his show as well, where he asked me a whole bunch of questions about On the Corner of Ego and Desire. So that's also in the show notes if you guys want to listen to our conversation about that. But Griffin is an amazing human being, and uh, he created a cool, cool documentary called Sriracha, which is basically the origin story of the condiment that has a cult following around the world. And he made obscene amounts of money with it. And we talked about how he did it, uh, what kind of revenue streams it did, how he goes about making documentary films. And he even has a course on Creative Live about how to make documentary films, a documentary short films. And I'll put a link about that in the show notes. But without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Griffin Hammond. I'd like to welcome to the show Griffin Hammond, man. Thank you so, so much for being on the show. Of course. I'm happy to be here, Alex. Thank you. Uh, I was on, I had the pleasure of being on your show a few weeks ago. And I said, well, you have to be on my show. And Griffin's like, fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm sure it was an immediate yes. <laughs> I was very happy to have you on my show. And thank you for returning the favor. No, absolutely. You know, I, I followed your stuff for years. Uh, even before Indie Film Hustle, I always found you out. I, I kind of found you on YouTube, which we'll get into in a minute. But first and foremost, how did you get into the film industry in the first place? I've been into video production ever since high school. That's when I learned how to edit in Premiere. Mm-hmm. And then I was lucky enough to get into NYU Film School. Nice. And I was immature enough to fail out of NYU film. Nice. School. Even nicer, <laughs> even nicer like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it turns out you have to go to class to, uh, to you, get a degree. You literally there. failed out of NYU. That's, that's brilliant, man. Seriously. I'm very proud of you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, part of it was like my own hubris. Like I, I think I got there in my freshman year. I wasn't, I didn't feel very challenged. I felt like I already know how to edit. I already know how to shoot. Like I feel like we're kind of going over the things I've already learned how to do it. And I think I'm sure if I had just stuck with it and gone to all my classes sophomore year, I would have learned all the advanced stuff that I was craving. But yeah, you would uh, have had Martin Scorsese as a teacher and Spike Lee coming right. in and you know, all those guys. Right. But no, you're yeah. like, no, no, 
I don't want to learn how to edit. I know that. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, you come from you're you're the generation behind my generation, so you kind of grew up with um with this technology and and it, at a much younger yeah. age. I mean, by the time I got to the I was already in my 20s and nonlinear editing system was nonlinear editing was just getting off the ground. Right, so, yeah. So I I mean, in high school I would have killed. I was I was cutting between v- VCRs shooting on my Hi8 camera. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the day. So, yeah, I can imagine how it, it might be frustrating first year in film school going, this is a camera. This is editing technique. I can imagine right. that might be a little bit be vexing on your on your uh, on your psyche. <laughs> so then what but happened? So, end, so after you after you failed out, what happened? Well, I uh, I moved to San Diego for a little bit. That's where my parents were living. And uh, I didn't really like it there. So I ended up going back to the Midwest where I went to high school. I went to the school that all my friends were at, Illinois State University, which is not a film school. It's just a regular public Mm -hmm. four-year university. So I became a television major and I started doing live television news in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, Actually, the town, that's the big town, the small town where the school is called Normal, Illinois. Nice. Great name. Great name. And uh, it turned out that was probably the skill set I needed more so than the commercial fiction film skills I was learning at NYU. Because I think I hadn't realized it yet, but I probably wasn't into narrative filmmaking so mm-hmm. much mm-hmm. as nonfiction. Mm-hmm. And so I met some professors at ISU that were really into documentary. I started learning a lot of news gathering techniques. Mm-hmm. And that became the skill set that I needed for what I now do. Which is documentary films. Yeah. Yeah, you, I pretty and, much gravitate towards that. And you do documentary films. Uh, you do features as well or just short form? I haven't done a feature. My longest film is Sriracha, which is 33 minutes. And I kind of consider that a feature for myself because I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit ADD when it comes to editing. And like, I mean, that, that took me long enough to make anyway. It took me eight months to make that. And I just wouldn't be able to stand watching it for much longer than 33 <laughs> minutes. Like that was kind of the pace I wanted to create it. So I can't really imagine making a 90 minute film. I think just for my editing style, I would try to cram too much in and I wouldn't let it breathe enough to be a feature. Got it. Got it. Well, so, so after your, after um, uh, your time in, the t- in TV world, you, you fell into this, this world of YouTube. Can you tell yeah. me? Cause that's kind of where you made your bones and, and kind of got your name out there if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah, I, I'm i friends with this guy, Justin Johnson, who mm-hmm. he's made a bunch of really interesting websites over the years, like onlinevideocontests.com and filmfights.com, where I was competing with people and learning. Uh, this is what I was doing when I wasn't going to class. I was making videos on filmfights.com <laughs> to compete against <laughs> other young college students around the country. Right. And Justin also created with his friend Eric Beck the YouTube channel Indie Mogul. Mm-hmm. And Indie Mogul had been running for a few years, and then Google decided to buy it. YouTube actually bought Next New Networks, the company that was running it. And so Justin and Eric at that point didn't really like the prospect of working for a bigger company when they've been working for this little tiny company. So they decided it was time to leave, and they recommended that I take over Indie Mogul. And Justin had been looking for ways to collaborate and give me work over the years. And I had a stable job at an insurance company producing videos. Mm -hmm. And finally I thought if I don't take this job that Justin's offering me, he's going to stop offering me jobs. (laughs) Right. So I decided to be brave enough to leave my 40 hour week, very stable job. I could have had a whole career there and uh, decided to go work for YouTube. (laughs) And you weren't, were you happy in that other job? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person and I, I've had a lot of great jobs and I think I could be happy in a lot of kinds of jobs. I was very happy there. I mean, it's, it's a world where I was given a lot of opportunity. I was shooting videos at major events like a, and around the president. And I worked on with William Shatner on a short film. Like the company really let me travel and do some exciting things, mm-hmm. but uh, I didn't yet feel like I could call myself a, a filmmaker. I was a videographer. And then an indie mogul, you kind of did, you, you were one of the, what year was that by the way? I started it. I think indie mogul started in 2007 and I started there in 2011. Okay. And then, and then you just started putting out uh, how to videos basically on indie mogul, educating film. Right. A lot, 
A lot of people knew it for its uh, for Eric Beck's show, Backyard Effects. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And he's mm-hmm. this really talented creator of, of props, and you know he, he has all those artsy skills. And I've never really felt like much of an artist, so I knew I couldn't come in and do that. So I decided I would do, you know, talk about the things that I've learned, but. I also started to learn a lot myself and try to share those skills. So it was a lot of camera techniques and information about lenses and microphones and how to build your own lights and things like that. And there wasn't a lot of that going on back then, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, not too much. I mean, yeah, it was kind of a a small group of people where I kind of knew everyone else that was doing that. And yeah, it was a great, a great community that I was really fortunate to inherit from Indie Mogul and it grew <laughs> while I was there. But like, yeah, arguably none of the audience I have today would exist if it weren't for that kind of incubation period that I had. And how long were you there? And for two years. For two years making YouTube videos. That That's insane. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> job to get paid to make YouTube videos. <laughs> that's a really good job if you can get, the, if you can get it. Uh, but your heart is really in documentary filmmaking, correct? I mean... There's a lot of things I love. I'm. It's hard for me to focus on one thing, so I kind of like the balance right now that I have in my career of making tutorial videos, doing a podcast, doing work for clients, doing documentary work for myself. I did a little bit of journalism. I was a uh, I was covering the presidential election mm-hmm. for uh, from 2014 until election day. Mm-hmm. Oh God, that must have been a heck of a run. It was insane. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been. A I was hell around of a run. everyone who was running for president all the time. My God, that must have been crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was, I was at Donald Trump's election night victory party, I went because I thought he was going to lose. Right. I thought it'd be interesting to be at the losing party. I mean, he thought he was going to lose. All every, the staff every, everybody were joking lost. with us early in the night. Oh, yeah. were they? Were they really? Yeah. At 7 p.m. when we arrived, no one was at the party. Like, no one had really arrived yet. People were not, like, excited to get to this party. And most people were there by about 9 p.m. And around, like, 9, 30, 10 is when the narrative started to change. But yeah, by 7 p.m., like Boris Epstein, one of his campaign advisors, was like kind of laughing with us like, yeah, we're going to do real well tonight. <laughs> what? <Wow. laughs> Jeez. And um, was, are you doing anything with that footage or were you on assignment for somebody? I was on assignment for Bloomberg Television. So that stuff was being turned around real fast. Everything I shot over two years was going on the air about two days later. Oh God, that must have been yeah. awesome. That must have been that was a, that's a pretty good Set gig. Up my workflow. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That was a, that was an amazing job, and that was what brought me back to New York after failing out of NYU. Like mm-hmm. ten years later, I moved back to New York because Bloomberg hired me to do this, and it's because they'd seen my film Sriracha. Well, uh, before we get to Sriracha, because we're going to go deep down the rabbit hole on Sriracha, in your yeah. opinion, what makes a good documentary? What makes a good documentary short or a documentary feature, in your opinion? I mean, I just think, I mean, I'm sure it's the same with, with narrative. It's just, it's good characters. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, the things I like about documentary are the shooting. I like, you know, capturing beautiful shots. And I like conveying facts i like learning a lot i mean that's probably what draws me to documentary is i'm curious and i have a lot of questions and i want to answer those questions and i'm excited to share the answers to those questions in a film but ultimately i can make a film that's full of great shots and really interesting facts and that would get me about halfway there but i think unless you have a great character it's not going to be a compelling story i mean it should be a character who needs something and we go on that journey to discover if they find it or not very cool. Now, what kind of equipment do you generally use on your on your shoots? I these days I'm shooting with a Panasonic GH5, mm-hmm. and I've been using the GH line of cameras ever since the first one. Mm-hmm. I had the GH1, one, two, three, four, and five. And and just ba- basically, you just go out there with a lens, the GH5, and uh, what do you do for audio? My audio is usually a shotgun mic mm. and, and a Zoom recorder. I used to use a H4n back when I started with the GH1. Mm-hmm. Eventually, I switched to the H5 because I like it more. Mm-hmm. And but yeah, most of the time, you know, when I was doing news, it was as simple as hand holding a camera in my left hand, 
over my shoulder and holding a, a shotgun mic in front of my interview subject and just asking them to look at me. And then I'd have a Zoom recorder like hanging in a messenger bag off my off my shoulder. So you, I mean, as opposed to docu, as opposed to narrative documentary is really you can go out with basically a camera, a lens, uh, a recorder, and a mic, and you can go out and and make something. Uh, oh if, yeah. If if you're if you're trying to tell a good story, it's not n- nearly as complex uh, technically to do a documentary as right. it is to do a narrative. Well, and I love one of the things I, I love about news gathering is. Sometimes I would go out and it would just be a mess. You know, everything's handheld and I'm not getting exactly what I want. Maybe I have an idea that there's a story, but it, it turns into a completely different story. I like that in documentary, you can always save it. You can always tell the story of how it all fell apart. Like, <laughs> there's always like a behind the scenes story you could tell too. So you can always take the footage you have and find a way to turn it into a story. Whereas you go out and try to shoot your narrative. I mean, I know you change it up a little bit as you go. But if you fail to get a scene, now you're really in trouble. You're going to have to figure out a way to go reshoot it. Whereas in documentary, I think you could kind of, you could kind of fudge it a little bit. <laughs> makes, that makes perfect sense. Now let's get into Sriracha, man. How, how did, how does Sriracha come about? Tell me all about Sriracha. Well, it was at the end of, I guess it was a year into doing Indie Mogul. And I think I kind of realized I aspired to be a filmmaker but didn't yet feel like i had earned that title for myself for me the way i defined it i just knew that i needed to go to a film festival and show something on a big screen and i realized i had made thousands of pieces of art video art over the years but nothing that was intended for a theater audience Mm -hmm. and so i felt like i needed to cross that barrier and so coming back from a film festival in 2013 i just felt especially inspired like you know i think i'm good enough now i think I've honed my skills. I have all the equipment. I should just make something. And I thought about the category of that I like in festivals, which is short the short documentary sections. Mm-hmm. And then just started thinking about things I love because everyone says make films about the things you love. And really high on my list of things was sriracha hot sauce. Of course, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, you want to make a documentary about a hot sauce. It, that's, that's just an obvious topic for a movie. <laughs> well, it's funny because, like, you know, there's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a runner, so I thought about, like, you know, is there something in the, like, the running category? Could I go to Greece and make a film about, like, the origin of the marathon? Or yes, something? yes, so like, yes. Know, some, Absolutely. Why don't you do that? that? <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to Greece right uh, now. <laughs> right. I mean, there's a lot of things in, in my life I could just look around and say, I'm excited about that. I want to learn more. But, Sriracha started almost as a joke in my mind, like, well, that's interesting. That is something that I do interact with every day. I'm kind of excited about it. But the more I thought about it, I realized I have a lot of questions. And I think the same people that are passionate about this thing, there's a lot of people that consider themselves fans of this hot sauce Mm -hmm. who would probably go out wearing a T-shirt that says, I love Sriracha. And yet those same people might not necessarily know even basic facts about it, like what country it comes from or who makes it. And, and you the have, more I thought about it and researched it, I realized like that's the perfect place for a documentary to live, somewhere mm-hmm. between passion and that void of information. And that and that is a very cultish audience of for Sriracha, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. I, yeah, I mean, pe- people have merchandise and <laughs> shoes, bad, bad yeah. handbags. Uh, it's insane. And that's kind of what I thought the film was going to be. I thought, I'll make a film about how crazy the fans are. Like, I kind of imagined when I was designing the film in my mind that I'll find a wedding couple, a bride and groom that have like a (laughs) sriracha flavored wedding cake or something. Like, that's the kind of thing this film is going to be about. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I never found that. And David Tran, the guy who makes sriracha, ended up being a really compelling story. And it's good because I think if I tried to make the film about silly fans and never really focused on one strong character mm-hmm. I would have not been as good. So then you actually approached the company and you approached him and said, Hey, I want to make a documentary about you. And they just said, sure. Come right on in. They did not say sure. <laughs> they actually said no at first. Right. I mean, I, I started by connecting with like Hoi Fung Foods didn't even have a very strong, well, they didn't have any social media presence. So it was kind of hard to even connect with them at first. That's even crazy. Like that that product is yeah. built for social media. 
Yeah. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. This is, it's killing it in the, I mean, it was probably number two behind Tabasco, maybe still is. Uh-huh. But it's like, you know, it's dominating the US market of hot sauce. And yeah, they don't have an up to date website, they didn't have social media back then. <laughs> uh, so I went to this guy, Randy Clemens, who's the author of the Sriracha Cookbook. And he was kind of my point person for everything Sriracha because he had been. Ever since he wrote the cookbook, he'd been blogging about everything Sriracha. So he was the guy that knew all the characters in this universe. Mm -hmm. He knew all the things I might want to include in a film. And so I kind of, I think I may have even scheduled an interview with him on the books before I even contacted David Tran. And then he gave me the contact information for David Tran. Uh, Like I said, David said no. And then how did you convince him? Well, I went back to Randy and I said, (laughs) so David said no, what do I do? And he helped me kind of understand a little bit more in his limited dealings with David Tran that he had had. He, he helped me understand maybe what some of his motivations are. Like, you know, go back to him and say that you, I mean, it's true. Go back and tell him that you really love his product and you're doing this because you have a love for his story. You're not doing this for the money or something. You're not trying to exploit him. You're just doing it out of this like pure place of love. And I also really heavily weighed on the fact that I'm an independent filmmaker. It'll just be me showing up with a small camera, a tripod and a light. And it's not going to be a big production. It's not going to interrupt your business. And I think that was what he wanted to hear. Then he started to have a lot of questions for me like, okay, now this sounds possible and it won't be problematic. So let's figure out if this, we can do this. So you basically shot that whole movie by yourself. In the end, I ended up bringing a friend of mine to, operate the camera during my interviews like i would set up the shot on the tripod mm-hmm. set up the lighting and then i would be the one holding a microphone in front of david interviewing him mm-hmm. uh, so i there was i did have an assistant for much of it uh, but you know i think 90 percent of the b-roll i just shot myself handheld with and, no one else around and you traveled as well you traveled uh, around the world yeah it started with a trip to california because that's where the factory is and that's where mm-hmm. much of it's shot but then i also Went to Chicago because that's near where I was living and picked up a few things there. Went to some restaurants there. We did a Kickstarter eventually that was successful and I earned a little bit more money than I thought I would. So then I added a trip to New York and a trip to Thailand where really the story begins. I could have probably figured out a way to tell it without going to Thailand. Mm -hmm. But why why would you? But why would you? (laughs) I mean, seriously. Because even even from what I've seen of the trailer, I haven't haven't gotten a chance to see the movie yet, but from the trailer – you're you're on the boat. You're driving in the little boat. I'm like, you can't get B roll of that. <laughs> that's that's priceless. Well, yeah, there's literally a town in Thailand called Siracha. Of that's course, where the name comes from. Of course it is. Of course it is. Yeah. So you 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 work eight months putting this beast together. Uh, now, what was your marketing plan for the film? How did you? How were you going to get the word out on this movie? I had zero marketing plan going fantastic. in. Fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. It was a fantastic interview. Thank you so much for being on the show, <laughs> Griffin. Uh, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we'll, uh, don't call I us. I mean, <laughs> the original goal for this was to get into film festivals. Okay. Uh, and maybe the auxiliary goal was to have a film at the end of it. You know, I just, I thought I'd, I was, I was confident that I could make something I'd be proud of and this would be a good investment in myself, just having something that shows what I can do. Mm-hmm. And, Along the way, the goals changed a little bit. Uh, I eventually realized that there was an audience for this. I, maybe film festivals didn't need to be my primary goal. Just getting this in front of people on the internet was the primary goal. But I got really lucky early on. I told you that I interviewed Randy Clemens early on in the film. Mm-hmm. And he is a cookbook author and a freelance writer in Los Angeles. Now he lives in New Hampshire. But mm-hmm. at the time... He was so excited to be in the documentary that he just, you know, he took a selfie of himself and posted it on Facebook and said, hey, look, I'm going to be in a documentary about Sriracha. And a lot of his friends were L.A. area freelance writers. And so someone wrote an article in a small publication called OC Weekly, just based on the fact that they had seen this Facebook post from Randy. Mm -hmm. And then that got noticed by, I think, the L.A. Times. (laughs) And they wrote an article. 
Okay. And then the Huffington Post noticed it in LA Times, and then they wrote an article. And once Huffington Post wrote an article, then everyone wrote an article. I think it was in the Associated Press, and I mean, it was all over the country. Wow. And it was insane because the narrative, it was all because of Sriracha. It was because Sriracha was attached, that that name was attached to this. Well, of it course, was, you, know, you were you were leveraging the brand name, absolutely. Right. I mean, I didn't have to do anything. It was just the excitement of, there's going to be a Sriracha movie. Like, that was literally half the headlines. And I just thought, it's insane because you would never write the article, independent documentary filmmaker from Illinois <laughs> begins production on his short doc. <laughs> Yeah, generally, that's not the way these things are written. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was all because I, I picked a topic that people were excited about. And maybe, I mean, I I did it because I that's what I was passionate about. But I also got lucky and happened to do it right at probably its peak moment in pop culture. Well, And also, I mean, and, and I don't want to kind of um, fly by this, but – that is, was a I, you weren't being strategic about it, but it was a strategic move because you were leveraging uh, a brand that so many people know that <clears throat> the marketing will be done for you almost purely because of the th- the subject matter. It's, it's the same if I would make a Trader Joe's documentary on the inside workings of Trader Joe's, right. th- which is people are super passionate about Trader Joe's. Uh, in California, but also around the country, or other companies like Lego or whatever, um, you know, and 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 if there hasn't been anything about that topic or about that company or about that product, people are starving because there's a there's a fan base waiting for it. So you oh, yeah. have an audience waiting to spend money on this. So it is strategic what you did, and and I think a good advice for other filmmakers is if you could find a topic or product or company that you want to kind of go into that no one's really touched yet. Cause there is no other Sriracha doc, right? You are it. Right. Yeah. My only real competition these days, and most of it came years later is like other news stories that people, you know, I think CBS news eventually went into the factory and ABC news went into the factory. Right. But that's not the same. It says it doesn't right. have Griffin in it. Yeah. I'm still the only <laughs> documentary. Yeah. Right. Official documentary. That's been festival. Although someone could come along and make a feature and that would, you know, not mine's you. not a feature, so you can kind of compete differently. But you've already, yeah. This is this is this was released what twenty thirteen. Yeah. Well, all right. So the movie's been released now. So now you went to festivals. You won some awards. Um, how did you? I'm assuming you own it. You didn't sell it to a distributor or anything like that. You own all the rights still. I do. Yeah, I worked with a couple distributors. One of them was completely shady and mm-hmm. didn't pay me money. What? Me. What? Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that, that, that doesn't sound like distributors at all. <laughs> and the other one is a, is a distributor in the New York area uh, called Janssen. Mm-hmm. But again, I didn't sell it to them. I, I worked with two different distributors and I let them I signed non-exclusive deals. I kind of just wanted to see if they could do anything for me. And, and they did a little bit, but I think the majority of the revenue I've generated was self-distribution. And then what are the revenue streams that you were able to create for the film? The first one, and still the biggest one, I think, is Vimeo. Okay. I, Vimeo On Demand had just started when I when I came out with Sriracha. I think it had only been out for a couple months. Oh, so you jumped in at the right time. Yeah, and it was great because not only I, – I picked it because I like Vimeo. I, I was uploading my film to a couple different platforms and just found that I liked the quality at that point in time. And I liked the feature set. Uh I was a little bit worried that people would have to create Vimeo accounts. You know, mm-hmm. it's just like more step to stop people from purchasing, but it seemed like a good platform. And they were also willing to do a lot to help me because it was such a new platform. They were willing to, they did a little bit of promotion. They put it, they, they translated it into a few different languages. So we could have subtitles in other languages. Mm-hmm. They did some nice things like that. They even like put it in a trailer during South by Southwest. I didn't get into South by, which was the whole point of making the film. And then at <laughs> least they played part of my film before another movie. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I know the feeling of not getting into big festivals, man. It's, right. it's it, I think we've all gone through that. Uh, everyone listening has gone through that at one point or another. I'm assuming you submitted to Sundance as well. I, I only finished the film in, November. Oh, so, so I think I only hit like the late 
South by deadline, I definitely flew past the Sundance deadline. Sundance deadline. Yeah. Um, okay. So with Vimeo, um, you, you also mentioned in one of your articles you wrote that Vimeo has the best profit margin in the business. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. In regards to um, like sharing revenues with, with, with the platform, can you, exp- can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, that was really one of the primary drivers for why I chose it in the first place is that I think they only take 10% as their commission. Whereas I think iTunes, isn't that like 50 or no, iTunes is like 30%. 30%. Right. Um, And Amazon's like almost 50. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty common for these rev shares to be almost, you know, close to 50%. Right. And so Vimeo, they take 10% and then there's also a little transaction fee in there. So in the end, it works out to, I currently sell it for two ninety nine, mm-hmm. And when someone buys it, I get $2.30. Which okay. Is great. Which is awesome. Yeah. And, and, so, a, and how many did you, how many views did you sell uh, on that? On well, that platform? As of last time I counted it, which was at the end of 2017, right? Mm-hmm. Or no, end of 2016, I think actually, uh, is I had sold 7,200 uh, sales on Vimeo. Okay. And so that worked out to be a profit of $23,000. That's not bad. Now, yeah. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. Now, did you... And that was where I really focused my sales at the beginning. Like, I had done a Kickstarter campaign. There were 1,300 people who backed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I also made revenue that way as well. But uh, those people saw it first about two weeks before I released it to the public. And so I, I kind of did a big launch. You know, I let these 1,300 people know it's going to come out to the public in two weeks on Vimeo. Go tell all your friends. I went back to all the reporters that had ever written about it. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I made them be responsible by writing about it again. It's kind of like if you cared about, hey, there's going to be a Sriracha movie so many months ago, surely you want to write the article that now it's available. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, most of them did, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then, so you focused all your and so all your marketing efforts was focused on one platform at the beginning, right? Yeah, it was just having a big premiere. And I think in that first, I think in the first two months, I did maybe fifteen thousand dollars worth of sales. So I think most of the money that I've made on Vimeo happened pretty early on. Is generally the way it works with with those kind of platforms, um, yeah. and then you then ventured out into iTunes and other places as far as the transactional. Yeah, I just when I got around to it after I was you know done, it was like a full time job doing the Kickstarter campaign and mm-hmm. a full time job releasing it on Vimeo, and then a full time job just doing kind of customer service for a few months and answering people's questions and doing press. I mean, that was lucky for me. I was getting a lot of press afterward too. For a while, I just became like the go-to Sriracha expert, and they were in the news a little bit here and there. So, like NPR would call me up and interview me. That's not that's not a bad place to be, right? <laughs> that's not a bad place to be. So then, all right. So then, but you did eventually go out to iTunes and other places like that, and you made some revenue out of those. Yeah, eventually, I realized I could go to an aggregator. I went to Premier Digital, sure, and I paid them. I think it was two hundred and fifty dollars for each platform to put mm-hmm. my short film on there. So it was mm-hmm. two fifty to get it on iTunes. It was two fifty to get it on Amazon. And so we did both at once. Uh, I didn't do prime at first. I just did Amazon video on demand thinking I don't want to cannibalize all my Vimeo sales, give it away for free. Was that a foolish thing to think? It was, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Explain. It makes logical explain. sense. It makes why. Yeah, there's a lot of people who listen to this the podcast that I've heard them tell me they're like, "Oh, I'm afraid of putting it on Prime or 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 free subscription based model based on an advertiser, or you get an AVOD model um, because you're like it's going to cannibalize your transactional where you make more money." Right. But in the in the lifestyle in the life cycle of a movie, don't do that on the month one. You could do that a month three or four right. because a lot of your money transactionally has already been made, correct? Yeah, exactly. So then, and, so then, what did so how how did it do the second you put it up on Amazon for Prime? Well, before I put it on Prime, it was you know it was just getting a few sales. It wasn't very many. I think in total, let's see, what do I have in total ever? It sold thirteen hundred copies on 
Amazon. Actually, that sounds pretty good. But it actually is um, pretty good <laughs> compared to some of my other platforms. And it wasn't very quick at first either. In fact, my Amazon Instant Video has probably gone up since I opened it up on Prime. Mm-hmm. But I just I thought about how I I'm a Prime user and I don't ever buy movies when there's all these free movies on there. Mm-hmm. And so it just made me realize, you know, I always have to put myself in my audience's shoes. Like, how could why, why would I expect anyone to buy it there? So I asked Premier Digital to flip the switch for Prime. I mean, it's already on Amazon. We just need to make it available for Prime. And as soon as they did it, it's just like the floodgates opened. And I told you I had 1,300 sales on Amazon Instant Video. Mm -hmm. Since I opened it up on Prime, I've had 230,000 views on Amazon Prime. That's a lot of views. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And how much did you get paid? I mean, the downside is they don't Uh don't give you as much, but – you get like 10 cents per view. I imagine it's just a share of the, the Amazon prime subscription cost, mm-hmm. which sounds terrible compared to Vimeo where I'm making two thirty per purchase, but mm. the audience size is just huge on Amazon in a way that Vimeo isn't. And so 20, you know, 230,000 people watching it translates to $23,000. That's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> that's not bad at all. That's insane. And that's a little bit more than you get on, uh, on YouTube. Oh yeah, a ton more. <laughs> I think <laughs> that like- was the funny thing is when I first came out with the film, I think my Kickstarter campaign I charged five dollars for it, mm-hmm. and I think a few months later I dropped the price to three. But when I first launched it on Vimeo, it was a five dollar film because I didn't want to. I felt like it'd be really unfair to have people pre order it for five and then lower the price right away as right. soon as you release it. Right. So I charged five dollars for it, and. A lot of people on Reddit, I remember there was some some article that someone had written about my film, and people in the Reddit comments were saying, like, $5, that's ridiculous. Why would you ever spend that much on a film, on a short film especially? And I agreed in some sense, like, you're going to go to the movie theater and spend $10 on a big-budget feature. I understand why you don't want to spend $5 on my short film. Mm-hmm. But it's weird how on Kickstarter, $5 was really cheap because other people are charging, like, ridiculous, like, $30 for their short film. And on, you know, on Vimeo, maybe that's too much for some people, but the same people were saying like, why don't you just put it on YouTube? You'll make a ton of revenue. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I, I think I did put it on YouTube. I, I put my um, director's commentary version on YouTube and I think I make a fifth of a penny every time someone watches it. It's so ridiculous. It's just, yeah. it's just ridiculous. And then you also got it on Hulu. Can you tell me the story about that? Yeah, I think at the time, in retrospect, I realized I could have just also asked Premier Digital, that aggregator, mm-hmm. to put it on Hulu as well. Mm-hmm. And I could have – it would have been smarter because I could have paid them a one-time fee and I would have made all of the revenue from Hulu. Mm-hmm. But – and I think Hulu is a similar model to Amazon. It's like $0.10 cents per view. It's ad-based mm-hmm. or it was at the time. At the time and, it was, yeah. Yeah. Now it's more subscriber-based. Mm-hmm. And – so, but I didn't put it on Hulu. It was actually Jansen's idea, one of my distributors, to put it on Hulu. And their fee, Jansen's fee, is 30%. Of course So it is. I made a fair amount of revenue on Hulu. It looks like it earned 21000 on Hulu, and then I got 15000 of that. Still not bad, man. Still not bad. Yeah. So, so then overall – oh, but by the way, how about DVDs and Blu-rays? Because I know you did that. I, yeah, I did a lot of those because I – let's see. It started as – I think Blu-rays were a were a Kickstarter reward. Mm-hmm. So I must have started with like 400 of those and sold a bunch of those for the Kickstarter. And then I think I bought another 200. I think in total I sold about 200 or 600 Blu-rays and I can't remember how many and DVDs people were I actually had. And people were actually buying those at like 15 bucks a pop? Yeah, let's see. I think it was like $10 for the DVDs and something like – 15 or 20 for the Blu-rays. And yeah, there, there are people that want physical media. I was not one of them at the time. I was kind of like, I'm only doing this because people are asking me for them. Because it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah, it's a total pain in the butt. I mean, in a way, it's kind of fun to have this physical object that represents your film. It's kind of a nice souvenir. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. the profit margin is really low. I think I calculate in the end after all my, you know, the shipping costs, I'm printing the... PayPal covers and, and all having that stuff, the discs yeah. and then eventually one of my big 
um, fees was once I put my film on Amazon Prime, it, there was kind of an incentive to sell my film on Amazon, the, mm-hmm. the physical media, because it all is this one unified page where people can watch it digitally or they can buy it. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And I wanted it to be available as a prime purchase. You get it in two days. And that requires that you actually send your inventory mm-hmm. to Amazon. Right. But they charge you like, I mean, I don't care. Storage it was, fees. Yeah, storage fees and then sales fees and all that. So in the end, I'm barely making a dollar on these things. But and with, and with a lot of headache as opposed to the digital release, which is a lot easier. Yeah, I mean, digital... You can sell a thousand or five thousand, and there's really no difference. Now, um, did film festivals actually help or hurt your film in any way? Like, because it's expensive to go to these things. Yeah, super expensive just to enter, even. And then I went to a lot of film festivals early on because, again, that was kind of the goal of making the film. And mm-hmm. it, that was really rewarding to see it on screens and hear people react to it. I mean, I wouldn't undo that. Mm-hmm. But it was definitely expensive, and it's hard to quantify what that did, if anything, for the film. I mean, it won a couple of awards, and you know, I could put all the laurels on my DVD cover, and maybe some more people buy it because they see the laurels next to it on Vimeo. Mm-hmm. But it's hard to say. Maybe, maybe it doesn't matter at all. Now, overall, are you happy with your final experience of making the documentary, releasing the documentary? Was it financially rewarding? I mean, I'm sure you didn't retire off of it, but overall, you know, was it a positive experience? Yeah, I, I've been teaching a lot of filmmaking workshops around the world the last couple of years, and I keep telling people that this was the smartest career decision I've ever made. I didn't know it at the time. I mean, I knew I, I had confidence that it would lead to good things and it would show people what I was capable of, but almost everything that's happened to me since is has a direct line back to Sriracha. I mean, the film made a profit, Mm -hmm. you know, in the end it's, it's made around $85,000 in profit. It's a short film. Let's remind everybody. It's a short film, (laughs) which in one way sounds like a really awesome number. I mean, because you don't expect, especially a short film, especially independent documentary to make any money to be profitable at all. Mm -hmm. Um, But then you have to ask yourself, is that, money really worth the eight months of production the freelance projects i turned down because i was busy working on the film the year of marketing and all that yeah this is not eighty five thousand in one year this is over the course of the last three or four years right yeah yeah in four years it made eighty five thousand. i mean it did make most much of that in the first year but uh but yeah it's not necessarily a sustainable model like i couldn't make eighty five thousand dollars every two years and live in New York City, <laughs> like, you know. Uh, <laughs> but if I were to somehow stack a bunch of films, this could potentially be a, a model that, that's lucrative. But If you could turn them around faster. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I wouldn't do this for the money, and I wasn't doing this for the money at the start. And I think the better return on investment has been that six months after I made the film, it led to me getting a job in New York, mm-hmm. which I made a lot more doing that job covering the election than I did making the film. You got that job specifically yeah. because of Sriracha. Yeah. They, they called me up because they saw it and they were like, we like this film. Uh, would you like to do this kind of thing for us? Would you like to cover the presidential election the same way that you covered hot sauce for two years? <laughs> yeah. That's insane. <laughs> and then, you know, it, it helped Panasonic notice me. I'm now a brand ambassador for Panasonic because I've been using their cameras and they liked that I used their camera on my film. Uh, the State Department found me and now sends me around the world to teach filmmaking in different countries because uh, they like they like the the moral of the of the film. They like that it's a self distributed film. They like my story, and they also like that it's a film about an entrepreneur succeeding in America. Genius. I mean, it's 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 remarkable. I mean, one, and I think that's a message that we all have to kind of put out there is that. You know, you could talk about doing stuff, but when you actually get off your ass and do something, mm-hmm. you never know who's going to see it, 
what it's going to lead to, what opportunities are going to come, what doors are going to open. Because it happened to me with Indie Film Hustle. It happened with me with my first film. It's even happening with my second film. And that hasn't even been released yet. Just the, the, yeah. the, the just people <laughs> knowing about it has opened up doors. Um, it's, and you never know, but you just have to get up and go do it. Yeah, I keep telling people that are just getting into this, you just have to make a lot of work because one, you'll get a lot better with each project. But two, I've found that I don't, it's not even always the things that I'm proudest of that have an impact on people. Like you kind of need to have a diverse set of work out there because mm-hmm. one of your projects is going to inspire someone or you know get someone to hire you. And it may not be the thing that you're proudest of. Now, can you tell me a little bit about your um, creative live course, shooting documentary short films, which sounds like an awesome course? Oh, yeah. That was probably another opportunity that came along because I made you think? Sriracha. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I don't think I contacted them. I think they saw the film and said, hey, it'd be cool to have that guy uh, teach a class. And so, yeah, Creative Live is a company in San Francisco, one of many online learning uh, websites. Mm-hmm. And they helped me develop a seven hour course on producing short documentary films. We tried to get everything that I wanted to share things that I had learned in the class. And it was great. Cause I think if I had just done it on my own, it wouldn't have been as good, but they had like, you know, they had a jib. <laughs> so it's like really great production value <laughs> in the studio. They I like that. Like audience. they had a jib. <laughs> yeah. They, they helped me design some, uh, we, we shot some stuff the day before the class to show during the class. So it was kind of this multimedia experience. So yeah, I have this whole like master class on shooting short documentary films available. Well, I will put that in the show notes for everybody uh, to go check out if they're interested in learning about more about shooting documentary short films. Now I'm going to ask you, you. Oh, of course, of course, man. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Um, okay. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Definitely make a lot of work, like I said. And, you know, I, I think we, we even talked about this on my podcast, that this industry is really forgiving for friendly people. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you could be the best cinematographer, but if you're terrible to work with, you're going to eventually stop getting calls to to work on projects. So I think just do your best work and do a lot of work, make sure people see it and just be really nice to everyone. And people will be excited to work with you. You, uh, by the way, I've, I've had over 250 episodes now on this, on this show and you are one of by far the nicest human beings I've ever met. <laughs> I don't know if it's all BS or not, but <laughs> From what you've put out from our interactions, me being on your show and you being on mine and the talking that we've done uh, off air, you're a very, very nice guy. I could only imagine working with you. You'd be just, hey, man, let's go, go, let's go shoot something, man. It's going to be cool. It'll be fine. <laughs> Is that a good impression of you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, it's a weakness, too, because I'm not a very adamant, strong-willed, passionate person. I don't always know exactly what I want in my films, but uh, – <laughs> Hopefully I make up for it because people feel pretty good about working with me. (laughs) I know the movie sucks, but I'm really nice. Uh, So (laughs) (laughs) exactly. Yeah. Don't underestimate how important that is. That no, no. And and that is a very serious message I want to put out there. And like being nice far outweighs talent in, in, in this business. You know, if you're a hustler, you work and you're will and you're humble and you're willing to learn and you're nice to work with. People will give you a shot as opposed to the talented prick um, that we've all worked with at one point or another. (laughs) And the connection to that is that I keep finding that, you know, especially when you're younger, you assume that like HR departments and the hiring methods of big companies are these really well-oiled machines. and They're going (laughs) to go out and find all the best candidates. And they really don't. I mean, people just hire the people they know that are conveniently available. So if you happen to be, you know, it's, it's, it's about who you know, and if you're a nice person to work with, they're not necessarily going to find you just because you're the best out there. You need to do the work of networking and meeting people and being on their radar. Or, or make a project that puts, puts you on their radar. Yeah. Um, now, can you tell me a book? Uh, what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Probably Robert McKee's story. Interesting. Interesting, which is interesting coming from a documentarian. Right. 
Uh, well, probably the reason that book, well, one, isn't Robert McKee portrayed by Brian Cox? Yes, brilliant. movie adaptation. Oh my yeah. God, so <laughs> I had not heard of him. Oh, I must, I must, I must have heard of him, but that was the, he he came to life in that movie. It's one of my yeah. favorite movies. I love adaptation. Um, but yes, Brian Cox played him brilliantly. Right. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And it's funny because it was only after I left NYU and I was getting my finishing my bachelor's degree at Illinois State University that I took a media writing class. It was kind of the intro course for all the journalism and TV and Mm -hmm. public relations majors. And the textbook for that class was actually Story by Robert McKee. And I mean, it's important that, uh, you know, it's a great book. A new story needs to have a solid narrative. It is. It is the book that I think every screenwriter reads, and his course is one of the his workshops or lectures. There's one of those lectures that everybody goes through at one point or another in Hollywood. Right, uh, yeah, it's just it's, it's it's one of those pieces. But yes, it's an amazing book. Um, now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Let's see. I'm probably still learning it. <laughs> that is the most common answer, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> that is the most common answer when I ask that question. I think I'm still learning it. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I still know less. Like <laughs> I know less <laughs> now than I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> There's still so many things I need to learn about this industry. Uh, something that took me a long time to learn. I mean, maybe I think it was especially – after failing out of NYU, I think it was kind of understanding that there are definitely things that I'm bad at and I just have to accept those things and kind of recognize them and move past them. Mm-hmm. Like I shouldn't try to be a screenwriter because I think over the years I've, I've thought I'm a good writer. I'm a good journalistic writer, mm-hmm. uh, but I can only write for really one voice. I can write from my own, from my own perspective and I'm not great at creating characters and stepping into someone else's mind. I feel like I'm an empathetic person, but I just can't really talk in a way that's not my own voice. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I I gravitate towards documentary because I don't want to write a script. But you want to tell tell a story. I like telling other people's stories, but I kind of need to just have a real person in front of me doing that uh, on camera. I can't really create a person. Fair enough. I think just recognizing what you're bad at and exploiting the things you're good at. That's a great lesson to learn. Now, what are yeah. three of your favorite films of all time? Let's see. Uh, I should throw Back to the Future two in there. Obviously. So straight. So you don't, so you made a specific choice of Back to the Future two. Yes. Which is arguably, and now we're going to geek out a bit. Arguably, many people believe it to be the lesser of the three. I don't, but right. because it's the connective tissue. So why did well, you pick that movie? I have to find out why. I think I've loved it ever since I was a kid uh, because it – I mean I think it has – You know, they go back to 1955. It has the future as well. I, I especially love the ending where you're playing on top of the climax of the previous movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I love all the different worlds it, it travels to. I mean it even teases the third movie. Yes. And from a technical standpoint, I love that that was the movie where – they invented that technique of the computerized dolly with repeatable movements. Oh, you know, motion capture. Yeah, so they could have forty-five uh, Michael J. Fox. Yeah, forty-five Michael J. Fox. Three different screen. performances in the same moving shot. It's pretty insane. It was pretty insane. Yeah. They, they definitely did used it very well. Um, what, are the, what are two of the other favorite films? Uh, well, the other two I should pick documentaries. I really like Grizzly Man by <sighs> Werner Herzog. Oh God, it was such an amazing film. Yeah, awesome, I mean, awesome it, I love it because it's, it's not even a film. It's not even the kind of film I like making. It's like a found footage film, but I just love. It, it kind of is. It's a kind yeah. of is with a voiceover. It's mostly someone else's footage. Yeah. And what's the and what's the last one? And then I'm also um, a big fan of Errol Morris and the Thin Blue Line. Yeah, that's a good movie. Very, very, very good. Also, movie. a style of documentary that I don't really do. It's very stylized kind of Errol Moore seems to do a lot of like mixing narrative style with documentary storytelling. And I don't do that, but I, I appreciate how he does that. And where can people find you online? At griffinhammond.com. 
to see <laughs> videos and tutorials and my podcast, all that. Stuff. And what's like the name? Of, and what's the name of your podcast? It's called Hey Indie Filmmakers. Fair, like right in your face, like right in your face. <laughs> it's very similar to your title. I realize it's even like the, almost the same acronym. <laughs> Mine is H I F, and yours is I F H. <laughs> yeah. Well, half the words are shared. It's a great podcast. Uh, a lot of great information on it as well. So, uh, I'll put I'll put links to all of your stuff in the show notes. Griffin, thank you again so much for being on the show, man. It was an absolute pleasure having you. Yeah, it's great to talk to you again. Thanks for having me. I really want to thank Griffin for being on the show and dropping some knowledge bombs on the tribe. We've never had a documentarian filmmaker on the show, so I really am very grateful for him. Uh, giving us all that great information. And if you guys have not seen Sriracha uh, and want to take a look at it, it's a great little film, man. It really, really is well done. And and it's not that expensive. It's only a few bucks. So if you want to check it out, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 258 to uh, get access to the short as well as links to anything we talked about in this episode and also links on how to contact Griffin, see all the things he has to offer, and uh, a link to his create a live online course about how to shoot documentary short films. So guys, I know this summer has been a little weird. Uh, We've been doing a lot of throwbacks instead of two episodes, just one. I've been really working hard on this special project that I'm working on for you guys. Uh, And again, it is not a feature film, but I will be announcing it sometime in uh, late August, early September, which I'll be announcing this major project, which will hopefully change the world no but hopefully we'll uh we'll find you guys will find some value in and uh and and you'll understand why i've been so uh so busy so thanks again for listening guys i hope you got something out of it and as always keep that hustle going keep that dream alive and i'll talk to you soon thanks for listening to the indie film hustle podcast at indiefilmhustle.com that's i-n-d-i-e-f-i-l-m-h-u-s-t-l-e.com 